Aloha and welcome to another episode of Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. I'm your co-host, Matt Johnson. Unfortunately, Justine is not with us today, but she promised me she'll be back next week. Um, as always, we are talking to Hawaii's movers and shakers in our local food system. So talking to farmers, chefs, foodies, writers, and uh, uh, as always, we have a couple of great guests. If you want to join the conversation, please tweet us at, at thinktechhi. And you can also check out the show afterwards on YouTube at Think Tech Hawaii. Um, so our guest today, uh, we have with us uh, Krishna Saranata and Aya Kimura. Uh, both are professors from University of Hawaii, and they are introducing their book today, uh, Food and Power in Hawaii, where they are both authors and editors. And uh, so we're all excited to kind of talk about the book and also talk about um, some of the other authors involved, so it's a, a compilation of essays. Um, so it's a very timely publication, so we'd love to hear more about how this all came about. So yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks all for having us. Yeah. Thank um, you. Before we get started, why don't you go ahead, can you just um, introduce the book for us and um, talk a little bit about it? I'm going to do it. <laughs> okay, well, um, as you mentioned, that there are a number of authors who are involved in this, and uh, you were saying that this is timely, but uh, in a, an interesting way, actually, issues on food and agriculture is always timely in Hawaii, mm. uh, because it's always on everybody's mind. And uh, we have, uh, how many are you? Like 10, 12? Contributors. Uh, contributors in mm. this, and uh, they include uh, a number of professors, uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa, as well as uh, UH West Oahu, okay. and then uh, some of our graduate students, former, now they, they are graduates mm. already, and then also some um, farmers and, uh, you know, activists that mm. were involved in this as well, too. Mm. So um, the essay varied in uh, format. Some of them were more, um, analytical and uh, giving the context of what we're looking at the changes in our agriculture and food system and others would be more personal narrative of uh, some people who uh, work in uh, uh, in the field itself okay and so the contributors are a combination of I guess professors like yourself mm -hmm. and then you have actual farmers out in the field and there's also community activists so it's a really neat plethora of, of experiences and, and backgrounds. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> That's what we hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So we have um, eight chapters that are mainly written by professors like us. Okay. And they are, um, they have, I think they have two audiences. The book has actually two audiences. The one is people in Hawaii, and we wanted to push policymakers, activists, and farmers and ranchers to think about the food politics in a way that's more nuanced and we wanted to pull in um, literature from agri-food studies that's um, like sociology of food politics of food literature uh, okay. that's a growing and exciting field in academia and the second uh, o uh, audience for this book is really those scholars who are working on the similar issues on food and agriculture elsewhere around the world mm -hmm. And so to, to speak to them, uh, we wanted to have the combination of both scholars as mm. well. As, so we have um, eight chapters and in between. We have um, narratives, what we call narratives. Well, um, so that's written by, uh, for example, Michelle Galimba, mm. who is a you know, rancher from Big Island. And she wrote her essay by herself. Um, we have farmers. And she's a great writer. I've seen a lot yeah, of her stuff yeah, before. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's a really moving story of her family and how um, she tried to cultivate the local market here. Mm. Um, uh, Specifically for beef? Local yeah, beef. exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, as a woman, I think she's a really interesting, um, you know, sort of person to talk about her experience mm. as a mover and a shaker of food system in Hawaii. Uh, I think women tend to be very invisible in food system, but at the same time, um, you know, they are a very significant food producer as well as consumers. Mm. Um, and so she is one uh, author of that narrative, and we have um, Chris Ralph and um, Dean. Dean Okimoto, mm. um, and they are inter they were interviewed by uh, Nicole Milne, who is now at uh, Kohala Center in the Big okay. Island. Yeah. So their experiences hopefully are captured in those narratives as well. And then we have another by um, Hile Kawelo, who does the fish pond restoration. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's so a Pai Pai Ohe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. her story was captured by an uh, interview by um, Monique Vernesco from West Oahu. Oh, okay. So it seems like it's a really good, well-rounded 
compilation of, of stories where it's um, researchers like yourself, but then actual practitioners, people out um, doing it. So if someone who's not familiar with local agriculture in Hawaii or is familiar with it, mm -hmm. it seems like it'd be a really good, um, well-rounded group of stories. And I'm excited to get my hands on a copy of it. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, talk a little bit about one thing that we were talking before the show that was interesting to me is, so uh, Krishna, your background, you're with the um, geography. geography department mm -hmm. and Aya, you're with the women's studies mm -hmm. department. So talk a little bit about how the, the two of you were hanging out on campus one day and you're like, hey, let's put together <laughs> a bunch of essays on local food, Literally. Uh, democracy. I mean, <laughs> how, how did this come about? Well, so this actually um, took a long time to birth. You mm. know, um, it's like a long childbirthing process. <laughs> and the story of geology really goes back um, six, seven years ago. So it's a long time to wow. make a book. And, and that's when um, I had an honor to organize a series of um, talks under the rubric of Watada Lecture Series. So Watada Lecture Series, an endowed lecture series that's housed in the Church of the Crossroads okay. on University Avenue in Honolulu. And they bring in scholars and activists um, from you know, around the nation uh, to talk about peace, justice, and sustainability. And so when I chair the committee to organize that, so that comes in every two years. And so when I had that opportunity to organize that, uh, we decided to focus on food democracy. And brought, we brought in uh, Francis Marlape, mm -hmm. who's the author of the um, Diet for Small Planet. Okay. You know, um, yeah. a big bestseller in, uh, in back in the 70s, I think. So we brought her in, organized a bunch of events. And after that, we were like, maybe we should write more about the issues here. Mm. Uh, what's going on here in Hawaii because very little uh, was, and I don't so hesitate to say like whether it was or is, written about agri-food movements mm. in Hawaii that's uh, accessible to outside scholars uh, mm -hmm. in the mainland. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that was the sort of early genealogy of that and it took a long time to you know, come, come here. Yeah. But I think uh, one thing to note also is that uh, Diet for Small Planet was uh, written in the 70s mm -hmm. and uh, the landscape of uh, global agri-food system has drastically changed over the last uh, 50 years or so mm -hmm. that um, you know even though we were motivated by that we're looking into what are the contemporary challenges that um, uh, people who are uh, interested in agriculture and food in Hawaii are uh, faced mm -hmm. with yeah so and as I mentioned, um, uh, especially seven years ago, we didn't have very many um, that has been written. Mm -hmm. And um, I came to Hawaii 19 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always worked in agriculture and food, uh, originally in Indonesia. And then when I was in uh, Colorado, California, mm -hmm. uh, I started working on that as well, too. So when I came here, I became immediately uh, an observer because mm -hmm. uh, in geography, Geography, um, people usually associate that with maps or GIS. That's the first <laughs> because, question that, because what I said earlier, that Matt yeah. was asking me. <laughs> Are you studying the map of agriculture <laughs> farms? I said, well, no, geography is a study of place. Mm. And, uh, and it's a relationship between uh, people and the environment. Mm. And uh, agriculture and food uh, is really like sitting in a dynamic nexus between people and environment and how the how people's uh, cultural, social, and um, politics and the economic structure affect mm -hmm. the landscape, the agricultural landscape in this case, mm -hmm. and how do the environment, the physical environment itself, shape what we can do and what we want to do with our environment. So that's, that's how I've always um, uh, connect the geography of agriculture and food mm -hmm. and I put it as a uh, like I, I teach a class on agriculture food and society in okay. at UH uh, at the undergraduate as well as at graduate level and uh, which, which department is that under the geography that's department, geography department. Okay. yeah that's a geography class mm -hmm. and uh, people sometimes ask me about like why I teach that in geography oh I thought everything would be in the It'd College like of Tropical TPSS right or, yeah uh, 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 then usually I mean like uh, it's important to study those, uh, to understand what's going on in the farm, mm -hmm. but I always think about uh, what I teach is to situate them in a uh, multiple scale, mm -hmm. like not just looking at the local level, but also regionally um, mm -hmm. or uh, within the global agriculture and uh, food system, yeah. because uh, we're all globalized now. Yeah. 
I think, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, we were talking earlier about how, you know, the land and the geography of where someone's farm is obviously going to dictate a lot of, you know, what they're going to be able to grow. But then there's also the cultural aspects of, you know, we're talking that there's a lot of uh, Asian immigrant farmers in Hawaii, so mm -hmm. they're bringing the crops that they're used to growing, and does that fit whether or not with the terrain where they are? Mm -hmm. And then it takes it to the next level of the market. Is the market going to support right. yes. um, the crops that they're growing? And, right. and I think you know we see that a lot, where you know maybe there's a focus on the terrain and also the cultural aspect, mm -hmm. and then when it's time to get the product to market, sometimes there there's a gap. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's something we see on, on my end, working mm -hmm. with um, CSAs and, and food hubs. Um, so I talk a little bit about your background. So women's studies, what, and you mentioned a little bit about, you know, working with Michelle Galimba and how mm -hmm. there's not enough women um, in, in, in agriculture. Talk a little bit about your connection, what got you interested in this? Yeah, I get this question. Like, so you're in women's studies, where you do food and sustainability, like yeah. what's the connection? Um, yeah, so I teach in women's studies, but my background is master's in environmental studies, mm -hmm. and um, my training in PhD is sociology and rural sociology. Okay. So I'm using food as a lens to look at social relations, including gender, race, and class relations. Mm -hmm. So my research has focused on the politics of food, mm -hmm. uh, capturing those multiple aspects around food. Mm -hmm. And um, but still, if you're sort of not convinced that food is also a gendered commodity. Mm. Um, we might think about, say, um, you know, who are food insecure, mm. right? And who have a um, hard time accessing, say, nutritional and affordable and culturally appropriate food in Hawaii. Mm. It's uh, women are overrepresented mm. amongst the food insecure in the United States and around the world. Mm. Um, and if we think about the role that women play in food servicing industry, you know, uh, yeah. waiters mm -hmm. and uh, people who are working in the food service industry, it's a highly feminized industry. Mm. So women tend to be invisible in food consumption again production, mm. but I think their role is really vital. So that's where sort of my women's studies focus come in. <laughs> and so, and then there's a so, and then both of you wrote an essay yourselves mm -hmm. uh, in the book as well. Um, before we talk about some of the other topics, do you guys want to talk about um, your topics? And we only have about 60 much. seconds before the break. <laughs> um, That's hard. So maybe just give us a little <laughs> teaser and then we'll get into it and when we come back from the break. Okay. Uh, well, I actually authored uh, three, in, the, in addition to the introduction overall, uh, I authored three uh, chapters. Mm -hmm. One is on... Um, uh, the paradox of important agricultural lands, mm -hmm. like uh, designating important agricultural lands, but uh, uh, turn out to be causing something that's not completely intended. Okay. And then the uh, next one that uh, we co-authored was um, the uh, use of volunteer, farm volunteer, mm -hmm. um, in um, uh, in the woofing, uh, and woofing programs, yeah. programs and we've had some guests on before talking about that okay that's good and then another one uh, that um, we're looking into this emergence of the seed industry the seed the corn seed industry okay. which is probably very controversial yeah. yeah we call it like a seed of contention <laughs> so I don't have the time to yeah, yeah, yeah. go deeper into that. Well, we'll have a little bit of time when we come back from the break. So, yeah, we'll be right back after a quick break. Hi, I'm Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Hawaii, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, which is on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock. Have a great summit. Take care of your mental health. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi, and you can catch me on Mondays at 11 on Think Tech Hawaii. Stacy to the rescue. See you then. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful, way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for Likeable Science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. Aloha and welcome back to Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. I'm your co-host, Matt Johnson. Um, as always, you can join the conversation by tweeting in at, at ThinkTechHI. 
And we are deep in discussion here with Krishna and Aya, two professors from University of Hawaii. And we're talking about your new book uh, that was just published in September, Food and Power in Hawaii, Visions of Food Democracy, which actually you guys are authors and editors, or it's a compilation of essays from researchers, activists, farmers, uh, addressing different issues in our local food economy. Mm -hmm. um, so right before the break, we were starting to get into some of the meat of the um, of the book. And we were talking about um, uh, seeds of contention with biotechnology, also land use issues. Um, we're going to list out some of the other topics it's here like that insecurity. I had written out. Mm -hmm. um, Ooh, also, current farmers, um, so the age, gender, ethnicity, um, that's definitely issues that uh, need to be addressed, and also uh, access to nutritious, fo nutritious foods. Mm -hmm. I think food insecurity is a very important topic that we should discuss. Yeah, well, that's, let's jump in right there <laughs> yeah. then. Um, let's talk about that, especially from right. your perspective in uh, women's studies. Right. Um, so, you know, one of the motivations of really editing the book for us was to um, intervene in this policy discourses that really focus on food localization and increase of the food production volume. Mm. And I think as recently as maybe a couple of months ago, the governor Ige talked about doubling the food production right. by 2030. Yeah. And, um, Which is a somewhat controversial yes. statement. Mm -hmm. um, people weren't quite sure what that meant. Right, exactly. And so I think there are a lot of nuanced arguments and, and analysis that we have to do before we say, like, just set the, the policy goal in terms mm. of the volume or tonnage of food or calorie-wise, you know, uh, let's increase the food self-sufficiency, mm. um, you know, that tended to dominate the policy discussion. Mm. But we felt that that really failed to capture new um, complex dynamics within the food system. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really falls outside of that that um, sort of tonnage-focused arguments or policy objective mm. is the issues of food security, mm. and um, or, and also the quality and diversity of um, food production ways. I mean, if you think about it, like how do we get to that the policy goal of say doubling the food production? The most efficient and perhaps the quickest way is to do monocropping, mm. large mm -hmm. scale that is highly intensive and which we could potentially achieve the goal of doubling the exactly. amount of right. food. Uh -huh. But then um, we might have to think, let's say if you do that, then that would mean the dependence on imported fertilizer, mm. imported agrochemicals, they are, uh, both of them are highly um, petroleum dependent. Mm -hmm. So we are creating different kinds of dependency. Right. So um, those kind of nuances, I think, tend to get lost. Mm -hmm. And another thing is that, and that's the, sort of the, um, the topic of chapter written by George Kent, who is a political pro science professor at UH Manoa. Mm -hmm. But he says that, um, you know, the poor people needs need to be center and focal point when we think about local food resilience that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have relatively high poverty rate in the state. Mm -hmm. I think one in six residents, according to the new uh, Hawaii Pussy Center's report, is under poverty line. Mm. And we have, you know, high food insecurity rate. I think uh, one in six or even higher uh, households are food insecure in the recent statistics. So um, George's argument is that if we really push for local food production, mm. that might really compromise those poor people's access to nutritional, nutritious, and um, healthy food. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's interesting. I think that kind of ties in a lot of these different access. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll kind of tie back into what you were just talking about, Aya. Mm -hmm. But, um, Kristen, one thing you are talking about that was interesting to me is the land use policies, uh, important ag lands, which is a relatively new, um, maybe the past 10 years was introduced to the legislature. No, it's actually 78. Mm -hmm. The mandate oh, okay. was the uh, Constitutional Convention. So give us a little background on IAL and, and, and what's your take on that? Okay, IAL uh, was uh, first mandated uh, in uh, 1978 mm -hmm. and uh, was not implemented right away. There's always a problem about uh, getting legislations to, uh, to really push it forward mm -hmm. until we got controversial issues and the trigger that ended up uh, uh, reviving the need for IAL. 
was uh, the uh, controversy of the golf course uh, resort uh, that was okay. built on, on the Big Island, the Hokulia development. Mm. And, um, and that's, that subsequently led into the passing of the 2005 and 2008 uh, IAL okay. that you probably are referring to, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, and so and so basically, what that means, and correct me, I'm probably going to mess this up, but IL, if you're a landowner, you can basically designate designate certain land as important right, ag land, correct. and then you're able to change the zoning of of other lands that you own. Yes, there is like a provision like that, mm -hmm. and uh, as far as we know, uh, we haven't really. Uh, I don't know what the more current one, but nobody has really taken advantage of that. Okay. Uh, so I'm not saying that there have been abuses, mm. but uh, the focus that we were uh, looking at is like uh, that uh, the intention of IAL mm. uh, was to prevent uh, uh, urban expansion, the sub uh, the suburbanization mm -hmm. of Hawaii. Um, and then we also try to see if we can revive agriculture. Mm -hmm. And neither of that has been completely rich mm -hmm. because uh, IAL uh, ended up uh, having a lot of exemptions that right. led into uh, the proliferations of uh, smaller subdivisions mm -hmm. that counties have the uh, ability to uh, regulate, okay. uh, even if they don't go into the uh, land use commission. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, our point was more that uh, having that becomes like uh, IAL becomes the goal instead mm. of the means. Mm. The, because originally the goals was really to have more agriculture and prevent uh, the uh, expansion mm -hmm. of subdivisions. But uh, eventually uh, what we saw is that the IAL become the goal in itself. Uh, okay. yeah. And neither of the other goals were uh, kind of like touch. Which is actually leading to my other points about like a lot of our agricultural policies and actions has been driven by these uh, controversies or mm. crisis. Mm. So um, the land use uh, uh, in agricultural lands were uh, the trigger back in uh, 2003, I think, mm. during the Hokulia controversy. Mm. And then um, the seed companies okay. became another controversy. Mm. You know. So um, whether it's um, and then the food, um, uh, the the spike of the food prices in two thousand and eight mm -hmm. and two thousand and nine became another controversy of mm -hmm. the self sufficiency. So these were kind of like uh, incidents uh, that uh, unfortunately lead into simplifications of what's really going on with mm -hmm. agriculture and food system, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's why uh, we thought like if we start this conversation and just like open up the like, uh, what's what's really going on because just solving important agricultural lands are not going to help farms become more viable right. just uh, addressing biotechnology and pesticide makes it more like a technical issue and mm -hmm. doesn't address anything about uh, what's really challenging small farmers mm -hmm. you know because they are not really like directly related uh, they, they are related through many different steps yeah. and so that's my uh, my two cents about uh, why we want to open these conversations. And it's similar issues we're talking about, just increasing the amount of food that's mm -hmm. being grown. It just can't be labeled that simply mm -hmm. because if we just say, oh, we want more ag land, well, then we've seen that with important ag land and then also with um, the seed companies coming in and then growing seed corn on ag land, mm -hmm. it's kind of meeting that initial lower level of mm -hmm. what we're trying to accomplish. But if you take a step back and, you know, what are we yeah. really want to see in terms of why being a more food secure place, mm -hmm. it's, we're seeing that you can't look at these in silos. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like it has to be a complete package that addresses all these, mm -hmm. these topics in, in one. And all along, we always hear from small farmers that would say that like, uh, well, you know, once uh, we didn't have lands, it would be very difficult to start farming. Mm. But even after we have lands, yeah. we have problems. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of them would be talking about how can we get affordable laborers. Mm. So that's where the volunteer like farm farming. Farm worker housing is another right. uh, big issue and a lot of farms that we work with talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then farm volunteering uh, becomes another uh, solution or mm -hmm. so-called solution, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, so talk a little bit about. I'm interested too. Like a lot of times, people say woofing 
you know, is, is basically woofing is where people can come and basically there's a trade where mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you have to work so many certain hours and you're provided with some kind of housing mm -hmm. and basically room and board. Mm -hmm. What are your, what's your take on woofing? Well, or it's, other similar programs? it's uh, supposed to be a win-win solution mm -hmm. because uh, farmers uh, solve their labor problem. Mm -hmm. And then for the woofers, uh, they have life experience. Mm. They come to a place that, especially in Hawaii, it's very popular. Yeah. Uh, so, um, what could go wrong with that? <laughs> I feel like you're about to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not wrong, mm. but it's... Um, not, it's not, a, not a total win-win. It's only a short-term solution, mm. which is only delaying the inevitable. Mm -hmm. Because usually when farms become more professional, mm -hmm. uh, they would really l like to rely on their uh, workforce that they can depend on. Right. And volunteers uh, are itinerant. Uh, at some point, they would leave. And there are a lot of woofers that actually stay for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, you, know, you, you can't depend on that. Mm -hmm. So uh, farmers end up bec being in this uh, initial stage for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it's delaying the inevitable. We never address, but like, how can we really get into this, uh, yeah. resolving the labor questions, right? And uh, so the, for the volunteers, their primary intention is really not just to work in the farm, but they also wanted to have uh, Life experience, yeah, experience that the place, and, and especially place, from the Hawaii, right, yeah. and other things so they want to do. So certain farms are more equipped to do that, mm -hmm. and others are not. Like, yeah. So certain farms become like favorite destinations, mm -hmm. uh, and and others uh, that are smaller, usually the smaller one, are also have a harder time. Yeah. So we've talked to like a woofer that uh, didn't enjoy it as much because he was the only one. Okay. In in the That's in a farm. a lot of responsibility on that volunteer. Yeah. It's it's not the the idea about like going to a bigger farm that uh, can accommodate half a dozen and they have a community, a small yeah. community of mm -hmm. themselves too. So it's not as simple. It's it's kind of a, a band aid probably yeah, yeah. at the most. It's coping mechanisms. I think it's good if, if the farm and also the volunteers address that and know that and see it as a short term right. um, yeah. you know, solution, but you know, right. longer term issues need to be addressed. Yeah. Um, so. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Can, uh, Already? Really, I know, it goes so fast. Can you just do a quick plug for the book again? Where can people find your book? I think it's at the major bookstores, like Native Bookstore, and uh, it's available on Amazon, and I don't know okay. where it's sold yeah. to. Yeah. The easiest one is probably online. Mm -hmm. uh, if so you go Amazon to and also UH Press? UH Press, mm -hmm. I think you can get discount uh, if you order before the end of the year. For oh, okay. UH I think you said like a 20% discount? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what they said. Yeah, but um, uh, Native Books uh, carry that as well. Okay, so at Nomea at the Ward, the Ward Center. Ward yeah. Center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And okay. then you have an event coming up that's... Um, oh, yeah. Uh, and. Uh, let me just plug in this another okay, event. Okay, real quick. Uh, World Town <laughs> Planning Day at the uh, Kaka'ako, the HCDA uh, building. Uh -huh. And uh, this year we're talking about growing local agriculture and we're going to have Jeff Melrose from uh, okay. the Big Island. Yeah. And then uh, I'll be speaking there too with Kim Lowry, one of another author. And we're going to have our books in there too. All right, great. Well, Kristen, Aya, thank you so much for joining me today. Super Thanks. informational, and we'll love to have you guys back and also talk about your future publications even after this one. Okay. So Great. thank you so much. Thanks.